All right, everybody, this is episode 94 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, CH. Today's single topic episode, I uh, came across this article, if you're watching this on YouTube, called Why Bitcoin is Valuable, Debunking the Greater Fool Theory uh, by Matt Hogan. Uh, and it was, it was a pretty good article, and I thought it was worth going over a couple of things um, that Matt went over here. Uh, I had a couple of additional thoughts that I wanted to get across to you guys, but um, yeah, let's let's jump right in. So, you know, it takes a long time to get over the hump that Bitcoin isn't a Ponzi scheme, right? Uh, when you first find out about it, you're super skeptical. You think this is worthless. Um, who's going to accept this as money? Why would this be useful to me uh, to exchange for other goods and services? It's not super easy to use. And that's a pretty valid argument to be quite honest with you Uh, i could see how anybody would think that and i certainly did when i first found out about it but as you start to learn more about money what money is the history of money maybe a little bit of austrian economics um, you start to come up with these uh, qualities of what a good money might have and as you start learning more about bitcoin you start realizing that hey uh, Bitcoin starting to check more of these boxes than I thought it would, so may- maybe there's something going on here. Uh, so, you know, Matt goes on to kind of talk about how big investors like Warren Buffett will, you know, talk shit about Bitcoin, basically, that it's rat poison, it's worthless, um, they have no value. And, you know, it kind of is what it is. It's Warren Buffett. He, you know, just recently bought Apple in the last couple of years. He's uh, doesn't have that good of a sense about technology and progress and where things are headed, but he's a smart dude. So everybody just lets him, lets him say his thing. And then they rip, rip on him later and make memes about him. But the greater fool theory is this idea that you should never invest in something. If it's value depends solely on selling it to someone else for a higher price. And I could see how someone would make the argument um, that Bitcoin kind of fits that critique, right, of the greater fool theory that, well, it's only going to be, it's only useful if someone else is going to give me more than I paid for it. Um, and, you know, I guess that's a somewhat of a, a valid argument if you don't know anything about Bitcoin. And you can make the argument that uh, Bitcoin doesn't generate any cash flows. It's not like holding a stock that pays a dividend or you own real estate and you're earning rents and cash flows. It doesn't uh, do those types of things. But With that being said, things are a little bit different now with Bitcoin. Uh, People are earning maybe 1% plus on running a routing node um, for all of the money that they have locked in these um, hash time lock channels. So there are ways to start taking your Bitcoin and earning Bitcoin with it. But I I don't think it's kind of in scope right now. That's super difficult for anybody um, to actually pull off. But uh, I think that will become... A capability that is much easier for the average person to do uh, just as as time progresses but we can make the argument until then yeah you can't generate any cash flows by simply holding bitcoin but there are other arguments um, as to why it is important to hold bitcoin because it's actually cheap to hold physically cheap to hold in an abstract uh, kind of way but the argument goes on to really compare bitcoin with oil and you know, the reason that they, that he does that is because oil wasn't particularly useful for anything as it was first discovered. It was just black sludge, right? It, it was actually kind of annoying. People would pay to have it removed from their land uh, in certain circumstances, which you'd think would be crazy uh, to see now if you had such a fantastic and useful resource in your land or on your property. But like anything else, um, Oil wasn't useful until somebody figured out what it might be useful for, like that that first light bulb moment. And, you know, uh, basically it was a light bulb, right? The the kerosene lamp, a, a way to create light was one of the first use cases of oil. And then everyone was like, oh, shit, this, um, you know, black sludge in the ground is actually useful for something. And then other smart people decided, hey, maybe we can figure out some other stuff that oil is actually useful for. Maybe it's useful for other stuff. And that process went on and on and um, petroleum engineers figured out all of the amazing things that you can do um, with oil and demand really skyrocketed, mostly because it was realized that oil is really useful as a fuel. 
and to to create energy to move or transport stuff and that is extremely useful and uh, many people like john rockefeller figured out ways to harness that energy and uh, build just unbelievable businesses that helped kind of progress humanity forward uh, the more energy that humans are using typically um, things are going well then it's it's getting better right you're figuring out new ways to use energy to make things um, better for your your fellow human right for you to exchange with and uh, you know that's really similar with with bitcoin today right bitcoin isn't really that useful if there's only two people using it as money right that it's just not useful um, bitcoin needs to be adopted more and for bitcoin to be adopted more uh, in my opinion the price needs to go up right you need to send a the price needs to send a signal to the marketplace to say all right something's going on here i need to take a closer look um and you know as when when bitcoin first launched right in in 2009 and 2010 it wasn't really that useful for anything people were still learning about it and then uh you know the those 10,000 pizzas or the 10,000 uh, the two pizzas were purchased for 10,000 bitcoins by Laszlo and that was one of the first recorded kind of medium of exchange transactions that happened right somebody wanted two pizzas and he had 10,000 bitcoins that he was willing to give to somebody else for those pizzas and that was when somebody realized, all right, this is useful to use as a money to exchange for other goods and services that you need. Um, and that was it. And then ever since then, there's been more and more demand for using Bitcoin for almost that, that single function of transferring value from A to B without needing to go through a third party, permissionless, right? And, and that is essentially the, the use case. Um, and it's just slowly and slowly being adopted. But the good news is, is that more and more new technologies are being built on top of Bitcoin and people are figuring out new ways to build new businesses um, that provide even more value to the marketplace. And that is just slowly going to add to the utility of Bitcoin and what it's what it's capable of doing for people, because everybody kind of has a different use case, right? I'm in the United States. I have a full-time job. I make my fiat salary. Um, I don't need Bitcoin to use as a as an actual money because the U.S. dollar surprisingly still works pretty well. Um, besides the fact that it's extremely inflationary and I lose purchasing power every year, other than that, it's you know does a pretty good job as a, as a money. Besides the inflation aspect, so for me. The only real use I have for Bitcoin right now is uh, is to save in it, right? I want to accumulate as much of it as humanly possible um, because I am speculating based upon all of the things I've learned about money in the last three years that it has a pretty good shot at becoming a money or a competitor in the money category for monies. Um, and that, you know, so you're speculating of that that use to be used as a money in the future. And the other thing you can think about is, well, if it's it has this fixed supply, right, 21 million coins, and and that can't be changed, so it has this absolute scarcity aspect to it, maybe you could think about it as a savings technology, right? If it's, if it's a fixed supply money, I know that um, if it becomes more and more adopted, the purchasing power of that money will go up and up and up. Right, so one Bitcoin today at around ninety four hundred dollars um, can buy you like a used car. Maybe it can be a down payment for a, a house in the middle of the country, um, or something else. But what if in a couple years that one Bitcoin can buy you an entire house? Maybe a small house, maybe a luxury car, um, <laughs> maybe a, a ton of things. And then what if in ten years it can buy? Um, five acres of land somewhere. And so, you, so you're getting this, um, this price appreciation and this increase in purchasing power because you're saving this value through time, right? But you're still speculating that it's going to become money. So, you know, on one hand, you can say, oh yeah, I use Bitcoin as a savings technology. I save 25 bucks a week or 100 bucks a week or whatever. 
and that's just money that I'm going to save into the future. Perfectly reasonable. I do it. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of people are starting to look at it like a savings technology, and it's a good way to think about it. And then you also have speculation, pure speculation where people are trading, things like that. Um, those are your big use cases, but it is cool to see how the savings technology narrative has really increased over the last year or so. And I'm really happy to see companies like Swan Bitcoin who are offering it. it the, the product is you make a one time decision to say, I'm going to save X number of dollars of fiat per week, biweekly, monthly, whatever into Bitcoin. And you're just holding it for the long term. And that's it. You're you're taking the fiat, putting it into the Bitcoin ecosystem, and then you're holding those sats into the future. You can use them whenever. Uh, I think that's a good use case for, especially for people in the United States, um, because they don't have to deal with like a lot of the capital gains issues and the taxes from selling and all that other stuff. You can just say, all right, I'm saving X percent on a go forward basis. You make that decision once, boom, it's, it's, it's done, it's over with. I like that. I think that's going to be a new use case this time around for this cycle. Because in 2017, it was more, you know, you're you're buying to get rich quick. Um, you're buying Bitcoin to send to an exchange to turn it into other altcoins and trade those. And uh, a, a lot of that went on in 2017. I did not, it didn't cross my mind that Bitcoin could be thought of like a sec savings technology. I could have if I wanted to. Um, had decided to dollar cost average in 2017 and just, all right, I'm going to buy hundred bucks a week or w w whatever interval and just on a go forward basis um, rather than all of the craziness that happened in 2017. So I think that's going to be a brand new utility that Bitcoin provides uh, in 2020 and 2021 that will be um, in addition to just the pure speculation that everybody kind of gets gets caught up in. But to, to think about that then this as a savings technology, what is that actually worth? And this is kind of getting back to debunking the, the greater fool theory, right? So if all of a sudden Bitcoin is useful in this example as a savings technology to just to, to save and store value, how much is that actually worth? And you know, the article goes on to say, well, if let's call gold a $9, $10 trillion market today, if Bitcoin gets to 10% of, of gold's um, market cap, then Bitcoin will be worth $50,000 per Bitcoin. Okay, that's interesting. But what if um, Bitcoin hits a market cap the same as gold today, right? And, and uh, then Bitcoin would be worth like $500,000 per Bitcoin. And I know these numbers can kind of sound... Uh, crazy if you are just kind of getting into Bitcoin today, but it is interesting to see that there's call it $10 trillion of value that is currently allocated to gold, knowing that gold really isn't all that useful for anything other than storing value. But if you're talking about gold's utility value as a, as a, as a metal, it's super useful in a lot of other things, but it's too. It's worth too much because it the monetary premium is so high. In other words, you know, let's call gold worth two thousand dollars an ounce, even though it's not. Just to make it simple, um, let's say five hundred dollars of that value is according to the utility value of gold as a as just a metal, right? So if it's going to be used for circuitry or electronics or whatever, it's like, oh yeah, I'll pay $500 an ounce for that to, to be useful in electronics. But the other 1500 is people's demand, value is derived from people's demand just to simply hold it and put it in a vault or, or whatever. Um, so it isn't doing all that much. So I, I think that's an interesting characteristic when you kind of compare uh, um, Bitcoin and gold, because I think they're, they're so similar, but they're so different. And obviously the biggest difference between them is one's digital and one's physical. And that digital and physical um, nature of each one is like a pro and con to each one, right? So from from a physical standpoint, for gold, the cons are, well, that it's actually physical, like you need to put it somewhere. You either can store it 
yourself at your home in a in a big safe or whatever and have guns surrounding it do whatever you need to do to protect it or you can have it in vaults but that introduces other issues like you're, you're trusting someone else right so you have to hand that trust function over to someone else but it also has a 5,000 year track record uh, people recognize gold it's fairly useful i don't know that anybody would actually accept it for anything even though people say that i think if you were selling even something common let's say you were selling like a an old phone and someone's like oh yeah i'll pay you in a gold coin I, i'm not 100 percent sure how many people would accept that just like i'm not sure how many people would accept bitcoin also so you know that's that's an interesting way to think about it that it's people think about it as money but you can't always use it as money um, and also the physical nature of it, it's, you know, it's expensive and heavy also. So if you're going to buy a million dollar house or something with gold, well, you have to transport it. And let's say you ever want to move to a new country, it's really difficult to take that gold with you, right? How do you, um, that could just be confiscated right at the airport and then boom, your, your, your gold is gone. Um, so the, so the cost of moving it, especially if you want to move it privately or as safe and secure as possible, the cost of that keeps going up. Or with Bitcoin, uh, if you really wanted to, not recommended, you can just fly with it, memorize your private keys, get across to whatever country you're going to, and then bam, uh, get a new hardware wallet or whatever, restore your keys, and there you go. You just moved an unlimited amount of value from one place uh, to the other. Or you can you know, fly with your seed. I don't know. Most people don't know what it is right now. If you can hide it in your backpack or whatever, uh, it's significantly easier and cheaper to move than gold is, um, is the comparison that I'm trying to make here. So there's just trade-offs between each, each one, and it's important to remember those. And I think um, it's perfectly rational for someone to come to the conclusion that Bitcoin, because of its unique characteristics – that it is digital, that it is in essence like this this private property and you, you need your private keys in order to do anything with it. It can't just be confiscated or taken from you. It does have these unique characteristics that are so useful as a money and as a savings technology that I can I can see that argument start to be made for other people to say, I'm going to save X number of dollars in Bitcoin a week, or I'm going to allocate X percentage of my net worth into Bitcoin. And I, I think that really is starting to grow, especially with um, the Paul Tudor Jones news of him. He basically, what, what like a $200 million position or something like that um, for, for 2% of his net worth into Bitcoin. I mean, uh, I give the guy a lot of credit because luckily he's, such a legendary investor that he can make mistakes and nobody's going to care. But right now, if you are in your thirties or forties and are a fund manager or, and you, you say you want to take a position in Bitcoin and, and it, let's say you're wrong, right? Um, I don't know. It sounds like it could be career suicide. So I, I can understand why people wouldn't want to take that risk. It's really just not, not worth it from a career standpoint. But some people are going to roll the dice and some people are going to really hit it out of the park if, you know, if they're right. And all of a sudden Bitcoin starts competing as a money and the entire globe can choose whether or not they want to um, use it as a money in, in this global economy. People like um, Pomp, right? Uh, starting a fund, wants to get pension funds in there. Uh, you started a business where you sell Bitcoin to people. It, it sounds pretty obvious, right? If you think Bitcoin's going to be useful as something or people are going to end up using it, the best thing you can do is try to sell it to other people. Um, it, it's simple and it's, and it's brilliant. But if, if you're correct about that, um, you've really set yourself up for a great future because not everybody can kind of see this coming. They can't see all the inflation. They can't see asset bubbles just in every corner of the planet and how you know manipulating interest rates has pushed up um, asset prices just all over the place. And it's really caused a lot of destruction um, for the average person who, who can't save what they've earned into the future. It makes things really difficult. It makes it really difficult to accumulate capital and other assets. Um, and I think that will change. And it, it, it's just such a, and the reason why I think it will be adopted um, is because it's it's just a great tool and it's super useful 
as money, as a savings technology. Um, everybody ends up switching to a better tool that does the job better. Uh, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything that would, if, if someone really takes the time to learn about money, the functions of it, and what would probably make a really good money, you can't sit back and learn about Bitcoin and then say, well, Bitcoin doesn't check any of those boxes or it, it can't check this one box and therefore it has no chance at becoming money or being used as a money. And I think just as, as number go up, um, more people will just end up convincing themselves. It doesn't take very much for you to watch people around you making a ton of money, Bitcoin going up, breaking to a new all time high and then, you know, doing its thing you can 100% convince yourself that Bitcoin checks all these boxes to be useful as a money because you want to join the fund. And I think the next, uh, the next cycle will bring in a lot more people with influence and uh, people are going to make a ton of money and probably lose a ton of money also. But you're going to have a whole new round of, of hodlers out there who are going to be able to make this argument of um, Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme. This isn't a greater fool theory kind of scenario. More and more businesses and use cases are going to be built on top of Bitcoin. And we really are just scratching the surface at what this thing can do. Um, and it's going to be so magical to watch it unfold. Uh, everybody's going to just <laughs> really have a good time as as number go up and all of these new use cases are built out uh, i'm very excited for everybody to to enjoy all of the human flourishing that comes along with that but this is episode 94 i'll make sure to put a link to this article in the show notes for you guys to take a look at it make sure to like and subscribe on youtube uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also listen to us on Spotify. Shoot us a DM, leave us a comment, let us know what you want us to talk about. We do appreciate that. And uh, yeah, cheers. Have a good one, guys.